Well, good morning and welcome again to Grace Chapel. My name is Joshua Manning. I have the joy and the pleasure of being the pastor here. It is so good to see you guys this morning. As you guys can see, I had a wardrobe change. Uh, Y'all already know what time it is, okay? No, nah, no, nah, this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this was a choice. This was a choice. And so my team doesn't come to town often, doesn't come to the Metroplex often, so I figured I would show up and show out today. Yeah, double down. Uh, and, and, you know, in the words of the great prophet Bone Crusher, I ain't never scared. <laughs> so, I'm so glad that you guys are here in worship today. Um, and I'm wearing my Judge jersey. I had a conversation or a heated discussion, whatever you might call it, a passionate discussion at men's breakfast a couple of weeks ago about when the Jets were coming to town. And so, despite what happened on Monday night, I doubled down. So, I'm wearing my Jets jersey and I'm praying for all you Cowboys fans. Because I have a healthy dose of realism about my team. All right. Um, but I'm so glad to see you all. Uh, we are in the second week of our series. Speaking of uh, homophones or homographs, whoever the grammatical people are here in this room, um, we talked about how there are words that are confusing. They look alike, but they're confusing, right? Or, or sound alike, rather, but they're confusing. There, there, and there, right? Two, two, and two. But we focus this series on the words so, so, and so. And last week, as we were talking about the word so, S-O, um, we related the challenges that we experienced by trying to distinguish words with what it might mean for us to discern the words that God has spoken to us, to discern what God has spoken to us, what God has said directly to us about our lives, about our gifts, about our experiences, and figuring out what we might actually be able to do with that call or with those words. Recognizing that if God calls us to share the gospel, that is not necessarily synonymous with a call to pastor or to teach. Right? And if we have a call to generosity, that might not be synonymous with taking a vow of poverty or sacrificial giving. And yet all of us are invited to worship God with our entire selves, with our entire being, beginning with our breath. In every single thing we do, we have an opportunity to take on a posture that is worshipful by recognizing that our breath is not our own. That our worship is a spiritual act. And God breathed the breath of life into us through the activity of the Holy Spirit. And so the easiest way or the most basic way for us to connect with God in worship is to recognize that it starts here. This week, though, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of sowing, S-O-W. And, you know, those of us who grew up in church or spent any amount of time in church, we've heard a lot of things about sowing. We might have heard the concept of seed time, harvest time. I grew up Pentecostal, so forgive me if I'm bringing concepts that y'all are not familiar with. <laughs> but we heard a lot about what it means for us to do the work of planting seeds. To do the work of planting seeds. We've all heard this concept spoken of in different ways, right? Uh, you reap what you sow, the law of attraction. We, we've heard of karma, right? The concept that what you put out into the world will come back to you. And I don't know about you, but my parents always told me, be careful what I said. Because uh, their concern or their warning was that essentially the words I said would eventually become a self-fulfilling prophecy. That if I said it enough, I would believe it. And if I believed it, I would start living into it. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that. Uh, the voice of an inner critic. Your own voice telling you uh, negative things and speaking negative things to you on repeat so much so that you start to believe it and start to live into it. Not because it's true, 
but because it's the only thing you're hearing. We began that conversation last week, right? We talked about worshipfulness and what it means to take a worshipful posture, a posture that honors God and uh, honors the creation, connects us with one another. But that raises a question for us, right? Um, If we choose to be worshipful, right, what then can we expect in return for our choices? If we choose to worship God in everything that we do, what then can we expect in return? Because a lot of us are anticipating a return on the investment of our time, our energy, and our resources. We anticipate that by doing something, we receive something in return. And what can we expect to receive for choosing to be worshipful, for choosing to be generous, for choosing to share the gospel, for choosing all of these things that we may consider honoring God? In the letter to the Galatians, you will find these words. We're going to read verses 7 through 10 of chapter 6. Listen now for a word from God. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whatever, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this time of worship. God, we are so grateful for the ways in which we've already experienced your presence in song in participating, in observing the presentation of Bibles to our students, to our young ones. God, we have experienced you from the moment we enter this space and exchange hellos with one another. And God, we thank you for each and every way that we have experienced you up until this point. And God, we ask that as we are continuing worship, that you'd open up our hearts and our minds and our spirits to receive what you were saying to the church. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening. Speak to our situations. Speak to our circumstances. Speak to our wounds. Our, speak to our hurts and our pains. Speak words of life and healing and restoration, liberation. And God, as I'm speaking, allow me to play the background as you take center stage. Not my words, but your words. Not my will, but your will be done. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning from the thought, what goes around comes around. What goes around comes around. But before we get there, I think it's important to recognize part of what's happening in this text Our reading began with these words. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. One of the challenges of being a Christian is that sometimes we misconceptualize grace. We misconceptualize and misunderstand the grace of God. Grace is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. Grace is not a get-out-of-jail-free card for our bad behavior. Some of us have learned to hide behind grace as a way of excusing ourselves and others. We've learned to hide behind God's grace as a way of excusing ourselves from being accountable. We treat it as if God is enabling our deviance. One of the things about choosing to be worshipful is also choosing to be accountable. Choosing to be accountable. Grace is not the absence of consequences. It is freedom from the shame of consequence. 
Grace is not the absence of consequences. It is freedom from the shame that comes along with consequences. As created beings, we are subject to certain natural laws, such as gravity or mortality. Things happen as a result of choices that we make at times. But just because we are recipients of God's grace, it does not excuse us from the way that nature works. Which is why I think the Apostle Paul starts with these words, God is not mocked. You reap what you sow. And that's not necessarily a warning, that's just a fact. The way nature works, if you plant a seed in the ground, you plant an apple seed in the ground, what do you expect to come out of the ground? You plant an orange seed in the ground, what do you expect to come out of the ground? You plant pineapples, what do you expect to come out of the ground? You, you anticipate that what you put in is what you're going to get. I don't know about you, but I spent a lot of time in church shouting off of the fact that I thought I would never receive any consequences for my choices. That nothing would ever go wrong. Just because grace. God's grace is sufficient. I heard all types of things misquoted and taken out of context. God's grace is sufficient. So no matter what you do, grace will cover you. Yes, and... There are consequences for our actions. There are consequences for our actions. So grace is not the absence of consequences, right? It is the freedom to live into the reality that through Christ, there is life beyond them. That in Christ, there is life beyond our consequences. That's a very different way of thinking about that. I don't know about you, I made some choices that I wish I could take back, but some things just happen the way they happen, and we all have to learn how to live beyond them. That despite the impact these choices have on our lives, that we have freedom to live beyond them. We as believers are indeed free to choose. Don't hear me saying we're not free to choose. We are free to choose. Right, a lot of us, uh, if you're hearing me saying these words, probably thought about the words you heard in 1 Corinthians or read in 1 Corinthians that say uh, that I have the right to do anything, you say. But uh, Paul says that not everything is beneficial. Right? I have the right to do anything, you might say, but not everything is constructive. You and I have the freedom to choose. That is the greatest gift of God to humanity. We tell our free will all the time. We tell our real choice all the time. That is the greatest gift to humanity, that we get to choose how we live. And as Christians, we spend a lot of time talking about what's permissible and what's not permissible. Spend a lot of time talking about that. Right? What, what lifestyle or life choices God might honor and what lifestyle and what life choices God does not honor. And so, yes, there is freedom to live. There's freedom to choose. There's freedom not to be subject to our whims, to our desires, to recognize that we can live life beyond those things and also recognize But it doesn't mean there aren't consequences for our choices. Case in point, the Apostle Paul, as he's sharing the gospel, knows it's against the law. Knows for certain it is against the law and still takes that risk. The Spirit doesn't stop him from getting imprisoned. Grace doesn't stop him from getting imprisoned. Grace does indeed influence how he experiences those consequences, but it doesn't change the consequence. Even if he was doing what was right, what was just, there was still a consequence for his choices. And yet, in the midst of those consequences, his life is full beyond them. His life is full beyond them. God is not mocked. There are certain natural laws that we are all accountable to, and yet we recognize that we have choices in how we respond to them, that we can choose to 
sow to the flesh, as the writer of Galatians says, or we can choose to sow to the spirit. Sowing to the flesh seems very... Um, Hmm. we're creating a dichotomy here, right, between flesh and spirit. And now sometimes it's hard for some of us to hear, right, because all things are not just black and white. Most things are some shade of gray, right? But what I think is important to recognize here is that sowing to the flesh for the writer here is about depending on your own ability for salvation in particular, depending on one's own ability for salvation, and not just ability, but your things that you can actualize on your own, right? You can learn what's permissible and not permissible on your own. You can choose a certain line of behaviors on your own. If you read enough scripture, I guarantee you'll come up with a great list of what to do and not do. And if you follow that list, In many ways, for this writer, that's what it means to sow into the flesh. If salvation, if freedom from sin and the like is tethered to what you can do, then that's really where you're going to get it. That's what you're going to get. It's everything you can do by your own ability. Sowing to the Spirit, for this writer and really for us, as we talked about more than once even today, it starts here. We have all been given the gift of spirit. We've all been given the gift of breath. And the question that we really need to ask ourselves is what might God be expecting of me in this moment? Not just your entire life, but just what, God, what might God be expecting of me in this moment? If I'm in a situation, how might God be calling me to respond to someone else's hate and vitriol? How might God be calling me to respond to a person that's really tough to love? How might God be calling me to respond to the temptation? How might God be calling me to respond? How might God be calling me to respond? I believe that what God calls us to far exceeds orthodoxy and orthopraxy. What God is calling us to far exceeds right thought, right theology, and right behavior. God is interested in our behavior insofar as it is influenced by our connection. God is interested in our behavior insofar as it is influenced by our connection, by how we choose to be. You know, a couple of years ago, during the height of quarantine, I took up a new hobby. You know what that hobby was? You never guess. I heard too many things to pick one out, so I'm sorry. Uh, running. I know it's hard to tell. I know. I know. But I did. I took up running. I took up running during the pandemic. And um, that was my primary form of exercise. I would go every other morning or so to a local park, and I would take a few laps around with the help of a coach on an app called Couch to 5K. And I swore up and down I was going to run a turkey trot in downtown Dallas. Uh, I even read a book. The book was called Endure. The book was called Endure. Um, Oh, it was almost there. There we go. The book was called Endure, Mind, Body, and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance. And I learned that endurance tests our physiological and psychological limits. And it was a both end. And I never could have imagined. I always heard things like, no pain, no gain. And I was just like, oh, I'm, I'm going to make it. Right? I would pick a, a point, and I would just run to that point. Even with the coach telling me I had about, you know, 0.5 miles before I reached the next uh, jogging point, I was like, no, I'm just going to do what I feel called to do in this moment. <laughs> uh, but all jokes aside, 
I learned that endurance tests our physiological and psychological limitations. And like any good millennial, before I actually decided to take up this hobby, I went and crowdsourced information from social media. And I asked my friends on social media one question. I asked them, why do you run? Because I saw a couple of my friends posting their, you know, their little, uh, I don't know what they're called, but, you know, little papers they run with on their bodies. Bibs. There we go. Bibs. All right. They, they would run, they would post their bids and their medals and their shoes. And like, I finished, you know, my first half marathon, my first 5K. Uh, and I was like, oh, this is wonderful. So I just asked them. I said, well, you know, why do you run? And everybody had different ideas about why they ran. Most people did what we kind of do, which is they just responded with what to do before you start running. They never actually told me why they ran. They're just like, here's what you need to do. You need to get some good shoes. Um, and I just need to say this. This is where I learned they were very different, like we have very different cultural experiences because I had friends that were like, this is the most money I've ever spent on shoes. <laughs> and I, on the other hand, was like, really? That's it? <laughs> so I went to the store thinking I had a whole bunch of money to spend, and I recognized it wasn't that much. Anyway, so based on my lived experience. Uh, so they shared the recommendations of how to get started, right, how to get size for proper shoes and the like. But one of my friends responded with something very deep and very vulnerable. And he just so happens to be a pastor, the pastor of First United Methodist Church Salina. He said these words. He said, I run because if I stop, I'll stop running and experience experiencing all the positive things that I named above. It's a momentum thing. If I stop running, then I'll stop experiencing all the things that I named, and I'm afraid of that, so I keep going. It's about momentum. Which made me think about the words of the, the Apostle Paul here. I think that the Apostle Paul is providing us with a self-regulatory principle to live by so that we can continue on the journey. Here's what I learned about endurance. And one of my favorite quotes from the book that I, I put up before was this, that if you can train your brain to become accustomed to mental fatigue, then just like the body, it will adapt. If you can train your brain to become accustomed to mental fatigue, then just like your body, it will adapt. The Apostle Paul says here that we should not grow weary in doing what is right. In other words, we shouldn't get tired of doing the things that help sow into the spirit. And I forgot to mention this. The hard part about sowing into the spirit is that those returns don't look the same. Those returns don't look the same. So you need a guiding principle to help you continue to make the right decision. But the more you practice, the more you learn. The more you train your mind and your spirit to respond to those distress signals, that fear of missing out, whatever it might be, the more we might find ourselves continuing to do the right thing. Endurance is not about our ability per se, but it is about our willingness to continue trusting that doing the right thing yields the right results even when it doesn't feel like it. Because at some point in time, we can expect a harvest. One of the other reasons this is hard to grasp is because the writer says something about like eternal life. And then can we all be honest for a moment here? Because I know some of y'all personally. This is not a concept that many of us grasp easily. This is not a concept that many of us grasp, grasp easily. We would much prefer to see the returns on our investments now. We would like to have a guaranteed date of maturation on our investments. I would like to know when I can expect my 12%. And yet, there is no promise like that here. There just says, if we don't grow weary in doing what is right, then we will reap in harvest time. 
what is harvest time? And when is it happening? Can I be honest with you? Nobody knows. But we know it's coming. The promise here is not when it's going to happen, but that it's going to happen. Not when it's going to happen, but that it will happen. So what we're given here is something that we can use to regulate ourselves, to choose what to do with the breath we do have so that the choices we make can ring through eternity. So the choices we make can ring through eternity. Here's what I mean. The writer says, and essentially by choosing what is right, that we have an opportunity to work for the good of all. That we have an opportunity to work for the good of all. Which means the choices that you and I make are not done in a vacuum. The choices that you and I make should be benefiting others. We talked about this last week a little bit when we talked about being connected with one another. Right? That we all had different gifts and different graces because we were all part of the same body. That is the body of Christ. But here the writer takes it one step forward and says that we are working for the good of all. Even those who are not part of the body of Christ. They're working for the good of all. And it says especially those who are part of the family of faith, not to disregard those who are not. And so I wonder how we might choose to be. Jesus says to his disciples that when it comes to determining who is faithful and who is not, you will know who they are by their fruit. You will know who they are by their fruit. Another way of saying that is you will know them by the seeds they've sown. Based on our conversations today, we talked about them. We talked about apples. I expect an apple tree. If I have an apple seed, I expect an apple tree. Orange, I expect an orange tree. You will know them by their fruits. In other words, you will know them by the seeds that they have sown. Because the seeds they've sown will bear fruit that looks like the seed that was put in the ground. So they've sown seeds of discord and gossip. Don't be surprised when it starts to swirl around them. If they sow seeds of generosity, don't be surprised when the needs of others are being met in their proximity. If they've chosen to live a life that is reflective of honoring God and honoring others as an act of worship with every single breath, do not be surprised by the fruit you see around them. Because they chose to to plant certain seeds. Unlike trees, this is the last thing I want to say to you, unlike trees, we get to choose what we put in the ground. We're subject to natural laws, but we're also not bereft of free will. Trees cannot change their composition. You and I, though, are not relegated to being what we've always been, or better yet, being how we've always been. We get to choose which seeds we put in the ground, whether we sow seeds that are limited to our own ability and our own desires and our own benefit, or whether we sow seeds that lead into benefiting and improving the lives of others. And if we sow seeds of resilience, speaking of endurance, we will reap the fruit of adaptation. If we can continue to choose the right thing over and over again, we will eventually learn how to adapt to those choices. You know, I started intermittent fasting recently, and my body was not happy with me. My body was not happy with me. And I promise I'm not becoming one of those preachers that's always going to talk about health and fitness. But um, (laughs) my body was not happy with me. And I recognized there was something different this time. I've tried it before. But I always say, I'm going to be flexible and I'll start at whatever time it is. Maybe I'll I'll fast until noon and then I'll start eating. But every day something would change. I'm like, oh, well, I have a breakfast meeting, so I'll eat now. My wife wants to eat and I'll eat now. My kids hit me up really early, so I'll go ahead and eat now. 
And I never, ever shaped my desires or allowed my desires to adapt to the outcome that I was expecting. And I wonder how many times we find ourselves shifting our choices because it gets hard to continue making them. How many times we might find ourselves choosing to do something other than what we know is right because for some reason or another, we're just tired of doing what's right because we haven't seen the fruit yet. But the good news is the results are coming. It's that the results are coming. I don't know when. I don't know how. But I know they're coming. And my hope for all of us here today is that we can receive that principle of self-regulation where we choose what is right, what feeds our spirit, what helps meet the needs of others. Because we have developed resilience and we have reaped the fruit of adaptation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.